Welcome back to the Buddhist Bookshelf YouTube channel. Today, we will resume our reading of The Sorrowless Flower, authored by Ngoc Tran, known as Dharma Name Thien Phuc, and this is episode number 28. 376. Ordinary people would praise the Tathagata for his superiority of morality. According to the Brahmahala Sutta in the Long Discourses of the Buddha, ordinary people would praise the Tathagata for his superiority of morality. First, whereas some ascetics and Brahmins, feeding on the food of the faithful, make their living by such base arts, such wrong means of livelihood as palmistry, divining signs, portents, dreams, body marks, mouse gnawings, fire oblations, oblations from a ladle, of husks, rice powder, rice grains, gear oil, from the mouth or of blood, reading the fingertips, house lore and garden lore. Skill and charm, ghost lore, earth house lore, snake lore, poison lore, rat lore, bird lore, crow lore, foretelling a person's lifespan, charms against arrows, knowledge of animals' cries, the ascetic Gautama refrains from such base arts and wrong means of livelihood. Second, whereas some ascetics and Brahmins make their living by such base arts as judging the marks of gems, sticks, clothes, swords, spears, arrows, weapons, women, men, boys, girls, male and female slaves, elephants, horses, buffaloes, bulls, cows, goats, rams, cocks, quail, Iguanas, bamboo rats, tortoises, deer, the ascetic Gautama refrains from such base arts. Third, whereas some ascetics and Brahmins make their living by such base arts as predicting. The chiefs will march out. The chiefs will march back our chiefs will advance, and other chiefs will retreat our chiefs will win, and the other chiefs will lose, the other chiefs will win, and ours will lose. Thus there will be victory for one side and defeat for the other the Asetsi Gautama refrains from such base arts. Fourth, whereas some ascetics and Brahmins make their living by such base arts as predicting an eclipse of the moon, the sun, a star, that the sun and moon will go on their proper course will go astray, that a star will go on its proper course will go astray. That there will be a shower of meteors, a blaze in the sky, an earthquake, thunder, a rising, setting, darkening, brightening of the moon, the sun, the stars, and such will be the outcome of these things, the ascetic Gautama refrains from such base arts and wrong means of livelihood. Fifth, whereas some ascetics and Brahmins make their living by such base arts as predicting good or bad rainfall, a good or bad harvest, security, danger, disease, health, or accounting, computing, calculating, poetic composition, philosophizing, the ascetic Gautama refrains from such base arts and wrong means of livelihood. Sixth, whereas some ascetics and Brahmins make their living by such base arts as arranging the giving and taking in marriage, engagements and divorces, declaring the time for saving and spending, bringing good or bad luck, procuring abortions, using spells to bind the tongue, binding the jaw, making the hands jerk, causing deafness, getting answers with a mirror a girl medium, a diva, worshipping the sun or great Brahma, breathing fire, invoking the goddess of luck, the ascetic Gautama refrains from such base arts and wrong means of livelihood. Seventh, whereas some ascetics and Brahmins, feeding on the food of the faithful, make their living by such base arts, such wrong means of livelihood, as appeasing the divas and redeeming vows to them, making earth house spells, causing virility or impotence, preparing and consecrating building sites, giving ritual rinsing and bathings, making sacrifices, giving emetics, purges, expectorants and phlegmagogues, giving ear medicine, eye medicine, and nose medicine, ointments and counter ointments, eye surgery, surgery, podiatry, using bombs to counter the side effects of previous remedies, the ascetic Gautama refrains from such base arts and wrong means of livelihood. 377. A dead lion is destroyed by worms produced within itself. According to the Buddha's prediction, the fate of Buddhism is just the same as worms inside a dead lion. No animal eats a dead lion, but it is destroyed by worms produced within itself, so no outside force can destroy Buddhism, only evil monks within it can destroy it. 
Buddhism so far persisted for almost 26 centuries, and during that period, it has undergone so many ups and downs with profound and radical changes. The innovations of each new phase were backed up by the production of a fresh canonical literature, which, although clearly compassed many centuries after the Buddha's nirvana, claims to be the word of the Buddha himself. In fact, Buddhist theories are connected by many transitions, which lead from one to the other, and which only close study can detect. In Buddhism, there is really no innovation, what seems so is in fact a subtle adaptation of pre-existing ideas. The first period is that of the older original Buddhism. During the first 500 years of Buddhism, it remained almost purely Indian. The first period focused on psychological issues, which concerned with individuals gaining control over their own minds, and psychological analysis is the method by which self-control is sought. The ideal of practitioners in this period is an erat, or a person who has non-attachment, in whom all craving is extinct, and who will no more be reborn in the samsara. The early sangha soon established a regular upasatha meetings, which helped unify and regulate the life of the community of monks. During the first 500 years of its life, several large meetings or Buddhist councils, in which matters of greater importance were discussed and clarified. The second period is the period of the development of Mahayana Buddhism. Around 700 years after the Buddha's nirvana, Buddhism began to develop in Eastern Asian countries. The second period focused on ontological issues. During this period people discussed about the nature of true reality, and the realization in oneself of that true nature of things is held to be decisive for emancipation. The goal of practitioners in the second period is the bodhisattva, a person who wishes to save all sentient beings and who hopes ultimately to become a Buddha. That is to say they want to transform all beings by developing their Buddha nature and causing them to obtain enlightenment. The third period is the period of the Tantra and Zen. Around 11 or 12 centuries after the Buddha's nirvana, many centers of Buddhist thought were established outside India, especially in China. The third period focused on cosmic issues. In this period, people see adjustment and harmony with the cosmos as the clue to enlightenment, and they use age-old magical and occult methods to achieve it. Practitioners in this period want to be so much in harmony with the cosmos that they are under no constraint whatsoever and as free as agent who is able to manipulate the cosmic forces both inside and outside himself. The fourth period is considered the period of the recent 1000 years, Buddhism started to develop, slowly but very surely, to European countries. This is the period of a complete Buddhism, and there is no need to add up any new thought or doctrine. However, this is the marking period of degeneration of Buddhism from all over the world. Buddhist theories have been degenerated with time. After each period spiritual practices will be diminished. During the period of the most recent 1000 years, spiritual practices will be near extinction. Even though Hinduism lost its influence when Buddhism gained its popularity since the 6th century BC Hinduism always tried to intermingle theories of Hinduism and Buddhism, which is extremely difficult for an ordinary person to distinguish the differences. For instance, according to Hindu teachings and its castes, every person has a specific place in life and specific responsibilities. However, it intermingles with the theory of karma in Buddhism by saying this. Each person is born where he is and with particular abilities that he has because of past actions and attitudes. Hindus also believe in the law of karma. Complete faith and fidelity to the theory of karma and reincarnation with rebirth in heaven seen as the final goal of earthly life. There is a universal law which operates throughout all life. Whatever is sown must be reaped sometime and somewhere. This is the law. Every action, every intention to act, every attitude bears its own fruit. A man becomes good by good deeds and bad by bad deeds. It is to say each person is fully responsible for his own condition and cannot put the blame on anyone else. You are what you are because of what you have done in the past. To a Hindu the past, of course, would include all previous lives or existences. They tried not to emphasize on the caste system because it totally contradicts with what they want to show Buddhist followers. 
Hindu theories and Buddhist theories are almost the same. Therefore, even the Palas, who regarded themselves as Buddhists, also prided themselves on their full observance of caste dharma, the Hindu relations governing all aspects of social interaction. The development of the Tantric Buddhism, which gave rise to a host of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, must have made Buddhism seem little different to the outsider or non-specialist from Orthodox Hinduism, with its multiplicity of deities. Before the invasion of Muslim military in the 11th century, there was even some degree in absorption of Buddhism by Hinduism, i.e. considering the Buddha as a Visnu. From the very beginning, Buddhism seemed to be a religion of royal families. Besides, the profundity of Buddhist teaching separated itself with the public and caused it to become a religion for intellectual people only. Under the sponsorship of the Gupta and Pala patron kings, Nalanda was supported to build by 100 villages and offered free training to more than 10,000 students, both Buddhists and non-Buddhists. In fact, the support of royalty was itself ambiguous in its benefits. Nalanda, so heavily sponsored by Harsa, was later neglected by the Pala dynasty, who instead favored the monastic universities that they themselves had founded, Vikramasila and Adantapura. According to Andrew Skilton in A Concise History of Buddhism, while Buddhism had become increasingly associated with centralized monastic learning, Hinduism remained based in the village, the Brahmin priest ministering to the religious needs of his fellow householders. The Buddhists, by contrast, were free from any immediate economic dependence on the communities around them through the cumulative effect of generous endowments from past lay followers and royal patrons. Perhaps they lost touch to some degree with popular culture, ceasing to proselytize and turning inward toward subtle philosophical debate and tantric ritual. Even the Hindu ascetics were mere wanderers, as had been the first Buddhists, and thus were free from this independence upon monastic organization and the necessary royal patronage, which had become the lot of the Buddhists. However, the problems of using religion as only a stepping stone for one's own business of a few of monks and nuns is one of the main causes of the degeneration of Buddhism in India. First, the misusing of the donation of a few of monks and nuns. Quite a few evil monks and nuns, instead of devoting their time to cultivate and to help other Buddhists to cultivate, they utilize their time to plan on how to squeeze money out of sincere donators so that they can build big temples and big Buddha statues. They even spend the donating money to care for their families and relatives. Their evil acts without any conscience cause sincere Buddhists to lose their good faith in Buddhism. Second, the misunderstanding of the Buddha Dharma and real cultivation of a few of monks and nuns. According to the Buddha, the Buddha Dharma is simply worldly Dharma in which we turn ourselves around. It is the Dharma that most ordinary people are unwilling to use. Worldly people are sinking and floating in the worldly Dharma, they are always busy running here and there, constantly hurried and agitated. The source of all these activities is inverbly selfishness, motivated by a concern to protect their own lives and properties. Buddha Dharma, on the other hand, is unselfish and public-spirited, and springs from a wish to benefit others. Sincere cultivators always think of others' welfare. Sincere cultivators always forget their own ego. They always give up their own interests and in service to others, and never bring uncomfortable circumstances and afflictions to others. However, most people fail to clearly understand the basic ideas that the Buddha once preached. As a result as we can see now, within Buddhist circles we find struggle and contention, troubles and hassles, quarrels and strife. These problems seem to be no different from that of ordinary people, if we do not want to say worse than what we can find in worldly life. Such people cultivate Buddhism on the one hand and create offenses on the other hand. They do some good deeds and immediately destroy the merit and virtue they have just earned. Instead of advancing the good cause of Buddhism, such people actually harm it. The Buddha referred such people as parasites in the lion, feeding off the lion's flesh. The Buddha predicted all these problems, thus he concluded that it would be pointless to try to teach others about his enlightenment, but the great god Brahma Sahampati intervened and implored the Buddha to share his discoveries with humankind. Besides, 
Hinduism underwent a resurgence before the Muslim invasion also played a big role in the degeneration of Buddhism in India. Before the Muslim invasion, it seems that Hinduism underwent a resurgence, and they spread it of Vaisnavism in the South, Saivism in Kashmir, and philosophers hostile to Buddhism, such as Sankara and Kurila, teaching across the country and gathering a considerable number of followers. Around the 8th century, Muslim military started to invade India. They destroyed the town and the Buddhist university at Vallabhi. However, Muslim military was stopped by local Indian rulers. Four centuries later, the 12th century, the Turkish military made a gradual advance into the mainland, and successive kingdoms fell to their troops. The Muslims extended their destruction presence across the whole of the north of the subcontinent. In 1197, Nalanda was sacked. Vikramasila followed suit in 1203. Muslim historians record that the universities, standing out upon the northern Indian plains, were initially mistaken for fortresses and were cruelly ravaged, the library burnt, and the occupants murdered before they could even explain who and what they were. Soon after that the Ganges Basin, the traditional heartland of Buddhism, was under the control of Muslim rulers. However, a majority of Buddhist institutions and Buddhist communities in southern India survived for several more centuries until slow succumbing to resurgent Saivism from the 8th or 9th centuries onwards. There is evidence to show that Theravada Buddhism survived in Kamataka until at least the 16th century and Tamil Nadu until as late as the 17th century. 378. Pleasant Practices According to the Lotus Sutra, the Buddha gave instructions to all bodhisattvas on pleasant practices as follows. First, pleasant practice of the body. To attain a happy contentment by proper direction of the deeds of the body. The Buddha taught the pleasant practice of the body by dividing it into two parts, a bodhisattva's spheres of action and of intimacy. A bodhisattva's sphere of action means his fundamental attitude as the basis of his personal behavior. A bodhisattva is patient, gentle, and agreeable, and is neither hasty nor overbearing, his mind is always unperturbed. Unlike ordinary people, he is not conceited or boastful about his own good works. He must see all things in their reality. He never take a partial view of things. He acts toward all people with the same compassion and never making show of it. The Buddha teaches a bodhisattva's sphere of intimacy by dividing it into ten areas. 1. A bodhisattva is not intimate with men of high position and influence in order to gain some benefit, nor does he compromise his preaching of the law to them through excessive familiarity with them. 2. A bodhisattva is not intimate with heretics, compassers of worldly literature or poetry, nor with those who chase for worldly life, nor with those who don't care about life. Thus, a bodhisattva must always be on the middle way and not adversely affected by the impurity of the above-mentioned people. 3. A bodhisattva does not resort to brutal sports, such as boxing and wrestling, nor the various juggling performances of dancers and others. 4. A bodhisattva does not consort personally with those who kill creatures to make a living, such as butchers, fishermen, and hunters and does not develop a callous attitude toward engaging in cruel conduct. 5. A bodhisattva does not consort with monks and nuns who seek peace and happiness for themselves and don't care about other people and who satisfy with their own personal isolation from earthly existence. 6. Moreover, he does not become infected by their selfish ideas nor develop a tendency to compromise with them in listening to the laws preached by them. If they come to him to hear the law, he takes the opportunity to preach it, expect nothing in return. 7. When he preaches the law to women, he does not display an appearance capable of arousing passionate thoughts, and he maintains a correct mental attitude with great strictness. 8. He does not become friendly with any hermaphrodite. This means that he needs to take a very prudent attitude when he teaches such a deformed person. 9. He does not enter the homes of others alone. If for some reason he must do so, then he thinks single mindedly of the Buddha. This is the Buddha's admonition to the Bodhisattva to go everywhere together with the Buddha. 10. If he preaches the law to lay women, he does not display his teeth and smile, nor let his breast be seen. 
he takes no pleasure in keeping young pupils and children by his side. On the contrary, the Buddha admonishes the Bodhisattva ever to prefer meditation and seclusion, and also to cultivate and control his mind. Second, pleasant practice of the mouth of a Bodhisattva. According to the Lotus Sutra, the Buddha gave instructions to all Bodhisattvas on pleasant practice of the mouth as follows. First, a Bodhisattva takes no pleasure in telling of the errors of other people or of the sutras, second, he does not despite other preachers, third, he does not speak of the good and evil, the merits and demerits of other people, nor does he single out any sravakas or pratika buddhas by name, nor does he broadcast their errors and sins, fourth, in the same way, he do not praise their virtues, nor does he beget a jealous mind. If he maintains a cheerful and open mind in this way, those who hear the teaching will offer him no opposition. To those who ask difficult questions, he does not answer with the law of this small vehicle, but only with the great vehicle, and he explains the law to them, so that they may obtain perfect knowledge. Third, pleasant practice of the mind of a bodhisattva. According to the Lotus Sutra, the Buddha gave eight advices to all bodhisattvas as follows. First, a bodhisattva does not harbor an envious or deceitful mind. Second, he does not slight or abuse other learners of the Buddha way even if they are beginners, nor does he seek out their excesses and shortcomings. Third, if there are people who seek the bodhisattva way, he does not distress them, causing them to feel doubt and regret, nor does he say discouraging things to them. Fourth, he should not indulge in discussions about the laws or engage in dispute, but should devote himself to cultivation of the practice to save all living beings. Fifth, he should think of saving all living beings from the sufferings through his great compassion. Sixth, he should think of the Buddhas as benevolent fathers. Seventh, he should always think of the Bodhisattvas as his great teachers. Eighth, he should preach the law equally to all living beings. Fourth, pleasant practice of the vow of a bodhisattva. The Buddha gave instructions to all bodhisattvas on pleasant practice of the vow as follows. The pleasant practice of the vow means to have a spirit of great compassion. A bodhisattva should beget a spirit of great charity toward both laymen and monks, and should have a spirit of great compassion for those who are not yet bodhisattvas, but are satisfied with their selfish idea of saving only themselves. He also should decide that, though those people have not inquired for, nor believed in, nor understood the Buddha's teaching in this sutra, when he has attained perfect enlightenment through his transcendental powers and powers of wisdom, he will lead them to abide in this law. 379. Perfectly Unimpeded Interpenetration. According to the Avadamsaka terminology, which is a Sanskrit term vatsu meaning matter or event or happening or an individual thing or substance. However, its general idea is an event. We, Buddhists, do not believe in the reality of an individual existence, for there is nothing in our world of experience that keeps its identity even for a moment, it is subject to constant change. The changes are, however, imperceptibly gradual as far as our human senses are concerned and are not noticed until they pass through certain stages of modification. Human sensibility is bound up with the notion of time divisions, it translates time into space, a succession of events is converted into a spatial system of individual realities. The idea of perfectly unimpeded interpenetration dharmadhatu is attained only when our consciousness is thoroughly pervaded with a feeling for a never-ending process of occurrences mentioned above. He world in which actuality attains harmony in itself. In the actual world individualism is apt to predominate, and competition, conflict, dispute and struggle too often will disturb the harmony. To regard conflict as natural is the way of usual philosophies. Buddhism sets up a world in which actual life attains an ideal harmony. 380. Study and beyond study. In Buddhism, studies means one who is still learning one who is still studying religion in order to get rid of illusion. Learning refers to the stage in which one must still undergo religious exercises to reach the level of a rat. In Hinayana those in the first three stages of training is stream entry, srotapanna, one's return, sacradagaman, and non-return, anagaman.
while a rat's is the fourth and last stage being those beyond the need of further teaching or study. However, the term learning in Buddhism does not indicate any worldly learning. A bhiksu or bhiksuni who spends all her time studying worldly subjects and neglects to cultivate his or her spiritual teachings and practices commits an expression of regret offense. A bhiksu or bhiksuni can study a worldly subject to upgrade his or her worldly knowledge, so he or she can enrich his or her knowledge for preaching in Buddhism. However, he or she cannot invite female or male teacher to come to his or her place to receive private tutoring. If he or she does that, he or she commits an expression of regret offense. A bhiksu or bhiksuni who reads worldly books and magazines, including videos, video discs, television and internet programs, as well as conversations on telephone and other images or sounds that have toxic effect, watering the seeds of sexual desire, fear, violence, sentimental weakness, and depression, commits an expression of regret offense. However, in addition to reading books on Buddhism, he or she can read books on the history of civilizations of the world, general history and teachings of other religious faiths, applied psychology, and most recent scientific discoveries, because these areas of knowledge can help him or her to understand and share the teachings to people in a way that is appropriate to their situation. In Buddhism, there are two kinds of study or learning reading and reciting sutras, and meditation and thought. The first important thing is that we must see the benefits of studying the Dharma, only then will we develop the strong desire to study it, for owing to our study, we understand Dharma, owing to our study, we stop committing wrongdoings, owing to our study, we abandon the meaningless behaviors, owing to our study, we eventually achieve Nirvana. In other words, by virtue of our study, we will know all the key points for modifying our behavior. Owing to study, we will understand the meaning of the Vinaya basket, and, as a result, will stop committing sins by following the high training of ethics. Owing to study, we will understand the meaning of the Sutra basket, and as a result, we will be able to abandon such meaningless things as distractions by following the high training in single-pointed concentration. Also owing to study, we understand the meaning of the Abhidharma basket, and so come to abandon delusions by means of the high training in wisdom. Study is the lamp to dispel the darkness of ignorance. It is the best of possession that thieves cannot rob us of it. Study is a weapon to defeat our enemies of blindness to all things. It is our best friend who instructs us on the means. Study is a relative who will not desert us when we are poor. It is a medicine against sorrow that does us no harm. It is the best force that dispatches against our misdeeds. Devout Buddhists should always remember that when we know one more letter, we get rid of ourselves a bit of ignorance around that letter. So, when we know the other letters, we have dispelled our ignorance about them too, and added even more to our wisdom. The more we study the more light of wisdom we gain that helps us decrease ignorance. Besides, a bhiksu or bhiksuni should not study teaching without applying the basic and essential practices of Buddhism in order to transform his or her afflictions and habit energies. A bhiksu or bhiksuni who is studying teachings of a profound, metaphysical, and mystical nature should always ask himself or herself how he or she may apply these teachings in his or her daily life to transform his or her suffering and realize emancipation. In Buddhism, the term asaiksa or beyond learning stage refers to the stage of aratship in which no more learning or striving for religious achievement is needed when one reaches this stage because he has cut off all illusions and has attained enlightenment. The state of aratship, the fourth of the sravaka stages, the preceding three stages requiring study, there are nine grades of arats who have completed their course of learning. A saksa is one who is no longer studying because he has cut off all illusions one who has attained enlightenment. A rat, worthy of offerings, is the asaksa or no birth in the Hinayana, while the Mahayana consider the Buddha, the asaksa. In Buddhism, asaksa marga is the fifth and last of the Buddhist paths. Following the fourth, the path of meditation, bhavana marga, the meditator overcome the subtlest traces of afflictions and of the conception of a truly existing self, Atman, together with their seeds. 
in this period, all defilements and perverse views about the knowable, such as belief in an inherent, permanent self or Atman, are overcome. It is at this point one becomes enlightened as either an Arad or a Buddha. A Theravada Buddhist who completes this path is then referred to as an Arat. A Mahanist who completes this path becomes a Buddha, and according to Sarvastivada at the end of this path, one becomes either a Sravaka Buddha, Pratika Buddha, or Samyak Sambuddha. According to Buddhist traditions, there are nine grades of Arats who are no longer learning, having attained their goal. These nine paths include the stage beyond study, where intuition rules, ungrasping mark, immortal mark, undwelling mark, mark of advancement, indestructible mark, unpleasurable mark, mark of wisdom of liberation, and mark of complete release. 381. Skill and means. Skill and means in Buddhism means expediency, method, contrivance, or method. Expediency and skill, adaptable, suited to conditions, opportunist, the adaptation of teaching to the capacity of the hearer. Means are methods which Buddhas and Bodhisattvas utilize to expound Dharma to make it easy for others to understand and practice to reach enlightenment. A means or expedient is a way which one uses to reach one's aim. Extraordinary skillful means is a good and virtuous practice which Buddhas and Mahabodhisattvas use to follow and adapt to the individual capacity, personality, and inclination of sentient beings to aid and transform them from unenlightened to enlightened beings. Practitioners who possess wisdom are no longer attached to forms and appearances, because forms and appearances are only expedients for them to advance in cultivation to obtain the Buddhahood. In short, skill and means is the ability to adapt Buddha's teachings and practices to level of understanding of one's audience. This is particularly important in Mahayana, where skill and means is said to be one of the most important abilities developed by bodhisattvas. It is the seventh of the ten paramitas. Skill and means are method. Means are methods which Buddhas and bodhisattvas utilize to expound Dharma to make it easy for others to understand and practice to reach enlightenment. A means or expedient is a way which one uses to reach one's aim. According to great master Tardhang Tulku, one of the most famous masters of the Nyingmapa sect, we have a responsibility to work, to exercise our talents and abilities, to contribute our energy to life. Our nature is creative, and by expressing it we constantly generate more enthusiasm and creativity, stimulating an ongoing process of enjoyment in the world around us. Working willingly, with our full energy and enthusiasm, is our way of contributing to life. Working in this way is working with skillful means. In Buddhism, skill and means means expediency, method, or contrivance. Skill and means or adaptable methods are used for convenience to the place or situation that are suited to the condition. There are several interpretations. Fung is interpreted as method, motor plan, and Tian is interpreted as convenient for use, so Fung Tian means a convenient or expedient method which is suitable to different sentient beings. Fung means correct, Tian means strategically, Fung Tian means strategically correct. Skill and means also means partial, temporary, or relative teaching of knowledge of reality, in contrast with prajna, an absolute truth, or reality instead of the seeming. Skill and means is one of the ten paramitas which the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas use as the method of expedient teaching to save sentient beings. This is the most important of the four supplementary paramitas. The term is a translation of the Sanskrit term upaya, which means a mode of approach, an expedient stratagem, device. Upaya also means to teach according to the capacity of the hearer, by any suitable method. The Buddha used expedient or partial method in his teaching until near the end of his days, when he enlarged it to the revelation of reality. In Siddharma Pandarika Sutra, Chapter 2, expedient means in which the meaning of Upayukasalya is elucidated through the doctrine of three vehicles, Trayanas, of Sravakayana, Pratika Buddhayana, and Bodhisattvayana, in order to respond to different temperaments of listeners. Expedient means is the way in which the bodhisattvas act for saving the beings effectively. Expedient means is not the crafty method of achieving one's objective. It is imbued with the morality of compassionate action with the purpose of bringing forth merit. 
Extraordinary skillful means is a good and virtuous practice which Buddhas and Mahabodhisattvas use to follow and adapt to the individual capacity, personality, and inclination of sentient beings to aid and transform them from unenlightened to enlightened beings. Practitioners who possess wisdom are no longer attached to forms and appearances, because forms and appearances are only expedients for them to advance in cultivation to obtain the Buddhahood. Skill and means is a weapon of enlightening beings, manifesting in all places. Great enlightening beings unite expedient means with transcendent wisdom. Enlightening beings who abide by these can annihilate the afflictions, bondage, and compulsion accumulated by all sentient beings in the long night of ignorance. Because of the different situations that arise, one has to use methods suited to the particular time and place. Expedient dharma implies that the methods are not constant and changing, but rather impromptu methods set up for a special purpose. Through those expedient methods or strategies, Buddhas or Bodhisattvas can help rescue and lead other beings to enlightenment. According to Lama Tarthang Tulku in The Skillful Means, skillful means is a three-step process that can be applied to any situations or circumstances in our lives. The first step is to become aware of the reality of our difficulties, not simply by intellectual acknowledgement, but by honest observation of ourselves. Only in this way will we find the motivation to take the next step. Making a firm resolve to change. When we have clearly seen the nature of our problems and have begun to change them, we can share what we have learned with others. This sharing can be the most satisfying experience of all, for there is a deep and lasting joy in seeing others find the means to make their lives fulfilling and productive. When we use skillful means to realize and strengthen our positive qualities at work, we tap the precious resources that lie awaiting discovery within us. Each of us has the potential to create peace and beauty in the universe. As we develop our abilities and make an effort to share them with others, we can deeply appreciate their value. This deep appreciation makes life truly worth living, for we bring love and joy into all of our actions and experience. By learning to use skillful means in all that we do, we can transform daily existence into a source of enjoyment and accomplishment that surpasses even our most beautiful dreams. 382. Preaching the Dharma. Teach the Dharma or teach the Dharma means to preach the truth so that people can realize the mortal danger or to preach others about Buddha's teachings with the hope that they will eventually understand and be able to escape the cycle of births and deaths. According to the Agama Sutra, in 45 years of preaching the Dharma, the Buddha must have preached many hundreds of discourses, but he declared explicitly that he did preach only on suffering and the end of suffering, and nothing else. He exhorted his disciples to go forth to preach the Dharma and to explain the holy life for the welfare of the many, for the happiness of the many, out of compassion for the world, for the advantage, for the happiness of the deities and human beings. The Buddha made it very clear that his purpose in preaching the Dharma was not to quarrel with other religious leaders or to compete with antagonistic doctrines. There is no quarrel in his preaching. He just shows the way to enlightenment and liberation from all sufferings and afflictions. The Buddha is always filled with love and compassion for all living beings. Even when he takes a rest, he still wants to spread his love and compassion to other beings. His preaching is only performed out of compassion and love for the world. However, at the end of his life, the Buddha emphasized on not a word has been said, nor declared. This statement was said by the Buddha when he emphasized the danger of abusing words. He said, In 45 years, I haven't said a word. Later, this statement has become popular when Zen masters using the statement to teach their disciples. Besides, the Buddha also emphasized on the unutterable. Later, in the 7th century, it became the Zen notion that Zen utilized to explain that the experience of awakening cannot be captured in words. This is connected with the general orientation of Zen, which is suspicious of the distorting power of words and concepts. One day when Majjalayana came to Visali to expound the Dharma to lay Buddhists in the street there, Vimalakirti came to him and said, Majjalayana, when expounding the Dharma to these Upasakas, you should not preach like that for what you teach should agree with the Absolute Dharma, 
which is free from the illusion of living beings, is free from the self for it is beyond an ego, from life for it is beyond birth and death, and from the concept of a man which lacks continuity, thought seemingly continuous, like a torch whirled around. It is always still for it is beyond, stirring, phenomena, is above form for it is causeless, is inexpressible for it is beyond word and speech, is inexplainable for it is beyond intellection, is formless like empty space, is beyond sophistry for it is immaterial, is egoless for it is beyond, the duality of subject and object, is free from discrimination for it is beyond consciousness, is without compare for it is beyond all relativities, is beyond cause for it is causeless, is identical with dharmata, or dharma nature, the underlying nature, of all things, is in line with the absolute for it is independent, dwells in the region of absolute reality, being above and beyond all dualities, is unmovable for it does not rely on the six objects of sense. Neither comes nor goes for it does not stay anywhere, is in line with voidness, formlessness and inactivity, is beyond beauty and ugliness, neither increases nor decreases, is beyond creation and destruction, does not return to anywhere, is above the six sense organs of eye, ear, nose, tongue, body and mind, is neither up nor down, is eternal and immutable, and is beyond contemplation and practice. Majalyana, such being the characteristics of the Dharma, how can it be expounded? For expounding it is beyond speech and indication, and listening to it is above hearing and grasping. This is like a conjurer expounding the Dharma to illusory men, and you should always bear all this in mind when expounding the Dharma. You should be clear about the sharp or dull roots of your audience, and have a good knowledge of this to avoid all sorts of hindrance. Before expounding the Dharma you should use your great compassion, for all living beings, to extol Mahayana to them, and think of repaying your own debt of gratitude to the Buddha, by striving to preserve the three treasures, a Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, forever. The Malakurti reminded Purna that expounding Dharma should always be in accordance with sentient beings' faculties. Purnamatrinaputra, you should first enter the state of samadhi to examine the minds of your listeners before expounding the Dharma to them. Do not put rotten food in precious bowls. You should know their minds and do not take their precious crystal for ordinary glass. If you do not know their propensities, do not teach them Hinayana. They have no wounds, so do not hurt them. To those who want to tread the wide path do not show narrow tracks. Do not enclose the great sea in the print of an ox's foot, do not liken sunlight to the dim glow of a firefly. Purnamajanaputra, these bhiksas have long ago developed the Mahayana mind, but they now forget all about it, how can you teach them Hinayana? Wisdom is taught by Hinayana it is shallow, it is like a blind man who cannot discern the sharp from the dull roots of living beings. The Malakurti reminded Mahakatyana not to use mortal mind to preach immortal reality as follows. Mahakatyana said. The Malakurti came and said. Mahakatyana, do not use your mortal mind to preach immortal reality. Mahakatyana, all things are fundamentally above creation and destruction, this is what impermanence means. The five aggregates are perceived as void and not arising, this is what suffering means. All things are basically non-existent, this is what voidness means. Ego and its absence are not a duality, this is what egolessness means. All things basically are not what they seem to be, they cannot be subject to extinction now, this is what nirvana means. 383. Profoundly Wonderful Dharma. After the Buddha's enlightenment, he realized, this dharma is so profound and difficult to comprehend for human beings because it is subtle and beyond any secular logic. It can be understood only by the wise. Besides, beings are always attached to sensual pleasures and delighted by sensual pleasures. The dependent arising is a subject which is hard to see, so are the calming of all the activities, the renunciation of all attachment, the destruction of craving, dispassion, stopping, and nirvana, etc. If I were to teach this dharma, human beings would not understand me. That would be more troublesome for me. Thus, at first the Buddha did not want to teach his dharma. However, after the third request of Brahma Sahampati, the Buddha decided to spread his dharma to save beings.
According to the Majjhima Nikaya, Volume 26, Brahma Sahampati read the thought of the Buddha in inclining to teach the Dharma, he feared that the world might be destroyed without hearing the Dharma. So he approached the Buddha and requested him to preach the Dharma. Oh, Lord, may the Lord teach the Dharma. May the welfarer expound the Dharma. There are beings with little dust in their eyes, who, not hearing the Dharma, will fall away. But if they are learners of the Dharma, they will understand the Dharma. In ancient times of Magadha there has appeared an impure Dharma thought out by stained minds. Open this door of deathlessness, let them hear the Dharma awakened to by the stainless one. Just as a man standing on the peak of a mountain might watch the people around. May the sorrowless one look down upon the people who are sunken in grief and overcome by birth and age. Rise, O conqueror in the battle, leader of the caravan. Freed from debt, walk over the world. Let the exalted one teach the Dharma. There are those who will understand the Dharma. After the Brahma Sahampati appealed to the Buddha for the third time, the Buddha, out of compassion for beings, surveyed the world with his Buddha vision. He saw beings with little dust in their eyes, with much dust in their eyes, with keen intellect and with dull intellect, with good character and with bad character, beings who are easy to teach and hard to teach, and few others, who, with fear, see evil and the world beyond. Thus the Buddha decided to spread his dharma. The Brahma Sahampati thought that he himself made the opportunity for the Buddha to preach the dharma, saluted him and passing around him to the right, then disappeared. 384. All things are preaching the Dharma. Objectively speaking, the Buddha Dharma is so wonderful that so far no philosophers can ever argue or deny. To many people, Buddhism is always the best. However, for non-Buddhists, the so-called wonderful teachings seem nonsensical if they do not have the opportunity to hear them. How sorry! It is certainly that the majority of religions want to transform a bad person into a good one. But there are still a lot of religious cults that rigidly give people with blind faith and make them more and more ignorant. Therefore, we need more Buddhist lecturers to propagate the wonderful Buddha Dharma. All things in the world are constantly expounding the Dharma. Some things expound wholesome Dharma, while others expound unwholesome Dharma. Some things speak of the deviant knowledge and views of heretics, others speak of the proper knowledge and views of the ultimate meaning of the middle way. In other words, those that speak wholesome dharma teach people to see through things, to let things go and to become free. Those that speak unwholesome dharma teach people to preserve their illusions and continue to cling tightly to things, and so on, and so on. According to the Avadamsaka Sutra, the Buddhas manifest hundreds of thousands of millions of sounds to proclaim the wonderful dharma for sentient beings. We, ordinary people, should always remember that all the sounds in the world are speaking the Dharma for us. For example, the sounds of the stream and creeks are just like the soft sounds from the golden mouth of the Buddha. The green color of the mountains and forests is the pure color of the Dharma body, delighting those who see it. If every one of us understands this principle, then absolutely everything in the world is speaking the Dharma for us. Good people speak good Dharma, bad people speak bad Dharma and animals speak the dharma of being animals for us. They enable us to understand how they got to be good, bad, animals, and so on. If you observe cats chase mice, lions chase tigers, tigers chase bears, bears chase deers, the strong oppress the weak, and so on. They are all speaking the dharma for us. Each has its own cause and effect. When we contemplate and understand things this way, we can get rid of all attachments, if not, we will forever be sinking in the sea of life of attachments. 385. 14 Inexpressible Things. Devout Buddhists only talk when they need to talk. In fact, Buddha Sakyamuni refrained from giving a definitive answer to many metaphysical questions of his time, questions of self exists, not self exists, if the world is eternal, or unending or no, etc. According to the Buddha, a silent person is very often a wise person because he or she avoids wasting energy or negative verbiage. If the person asks because he wants to cause troubles for the Buddha, the Buddha will remain silent. 
one day a certain man said to the Buddha that he would join the band of his disciples if the Buddha would give clear answer to the questions. Would the Buddha ever die, and, if so, what would become of him after death? What was the first cause of the universe, and what was the universe going to be like in the future? Why do men live and what becomes of them after death? If the person asks because he wants to cause troubles for the Buddha, the Buddha will remain silent. If the person asks because he wants to study, the Buddha's answer was to the following effect. Suppose you were shot by a poison arrow, and a physician came to draw the arrow from your body and to dress the wound, would you first ask him questions as to what the arrow was made of, what the composition of the poison was, and who shot the arrow, and, if the physician did not dress the wound, what was going to happen, and such blissful questions, and refuse the treatment until the physician answered all the questions to your satisfaction. You would be dead before you obtained the answers. In this parable the Buddha advised the questioner to become his disciple without wasting his time on problems which were too profound to be understood by an ordinary man, probably a long cultivation as a disciple of the Buddha he might come to understand. According to the Madhyamaka philosophy, the mysterious silence of the Buddha on most fundamental questions of metaphysics led him to probe into the reason of that silence. Was the Buddha agnostic as some of the European writers on Buddhism believe him to be? If not, what was the reason of his silence? Through a searching inquiry into this silence was the dialectic born. There are well-known questions which the Buddha declared to be of Yakrita, or the answers to which were inexpressible. Kadakurti enumerates them in his commentary on the Madhyamaka Sastra, that the Buddha announced 14 things to be inexpressible as mentioned in the following sentences. Whether the world is eternal, not eternal, both eternal and not eternal, neither eternal nor not eternal, and so on. Whether the world is finite, infinite, both finite and infinite, neither finite nor infinite, and so on. Whether the Tathagata exists after death, does not exist after death, either exists or does not exist after death, neither exists nor does not exist after death. Whether the soul is identical with the body, different with the body, and so on. 386. Relativity. According to the Random House Webster College Dictionary, the term relative means something is existing or having its specific nature only by relation to something else. Relative also means not absolute or independent. The word for reciprocal identification is more literally mutual and regarding that is mutually viewing from each other's point mutual identification, which is as much as to say an exchange of views. It is indispensable to bring about a reconciliation of conflicting opinions or effect a syncretism among opposing speculative systems. This trend of thought, in fact, served greatly to restore the original idea of tolerance, which was revealed in the Buddha's teaching, but was almost entirely lost in the various schools of Hinayana which resulted from differences of opinion. According to Prof. Jinjiro Takakusu in The Essentials of Buddhist Philosophy, Hinayana Buddhism is generally satisfied with analysis and rarely inclined to synthesis. The Mahayana, on the other hand, is generally much inclined to the reciprocal identification of two conflicting ideas. If one party adheres to his own idea while the other party insists on his own, a separation will be the natural result. This is what happens in the Hinayana. The Mahayana teaches that one should put one's own idea aside for a moment and identify one's own position with that of the other party, thus mutually synthesizing the opposed positions. The both parties will find themselves perfectly united. Reciprocal identification is more literally mutual and regarding that is, mutually viewing from each other's point mutual identification, which is as much as to say an exchange of views. It is indispensable to bring about a reconciliation of conflicting opinions or to effect a syncretism among opposing speculative systems. This trend of thought, in fact, served greatly to restore the original idea of tolerance which was revealed in the Buddha's teaching, but was almost entirely lost in the various schools of Hinayana, which resulted from differences of opinion. According to the Madhyamaka philosophy, phenomena have no independent, substantial reality of their own. Relativity or dependence is the main characteristic of phenomena, and that which is relative is not really the highest sense of the word. 
the absolute is the reality of the appearances. The absolute and the world are not two different sets of reality posited against each other. Phenomena viewed as relative, as governed by causes and conditions constitute the world, and viewed as free of all conditions are the absolute. According to Buddhism, the relative truth, or the truth of the unreal, which is subject to change, manifests stillness, but is always illuminating, which means that it is imminent in everything. Pure land thinkers accepted the legitimacy of conventional truth as an expression of ultimate truth and as a vehicle to reach ultimate truth. This method of basing on form helps cultivators reach the Buddhahood, which is formless. According to the Majjhimaka philosophy, phenomena have no independent, substantial reality of their own. Relativity or dependence is the main characteristic of phenomena, and that which is relative is not really the highest sense of the word. The absolute is the reality of the appearances. The absolute and the world are not two different sets of reality posited against each other. Phenomena viewed as relative, as governed by causes and conditions constitute the world, and viewed as free of all conditions are the absolute. According to relative truth all things exist, but in absolute truth nothing is, in absolute truth one sees that all things are devoid of self-nature, however, in relative truth, a perception where there is no self-nature. The doctrine of mutual dependence or relativity of all things for their existence, i.e., the triangle depends on its three lines, the eye on things having color and form, long or short. A table, for example, if you take the table as the object which you put your hand on, but search to discover what is actualius among the parts, whether this is it or that is it, then there is not anything that can be found to be it, because the table is something that cannot be analytically sought, and it cannot be found. If we take the ultimate reality or emptiness of the table as the substratum and search to see if it can be found, then it becomes a conventional truth in terms of itself as the substratum. In relation to the table, its emptiness is an ultimate truth, but in relation to its own reality, i.e., the reality of the reality, it's a conventional truth. In our daily life, in almost all circumstances, the reciprocal theory has been applied. Reciprocal identification by mutual self-negation, when realized, has a great practical value in smoothing out conflicting opinions or in creating sympathy among opposing parties. Through one or more of these methods diversity can be brought to union, and illusory existence is synthesized with the enlightened life. Such ideas as seeing noumenon in phenomenon, regarding motion as calm or calm as motion, identifying action and inaction, purity and impurity, perfection and imperfection, one and many, the particular and the general, permanence and impermanence, are all attainable by this theory. It is one of the most important ideas of Mahayana and is indispensable for a clear understanding of the Buddhist doctrine as taught in the Mahayana. The most important application of this doctrine concerns the identification of life in nirvana. Life itself is nirvana, just as water and wave are identical. Life is one thing and nirvana is another lifeless thing. If one attains nirvana while yet living, life becomes identified with nirvana but only in the sense of a state of mind, because the body still exists. But perfect or complete nirvana is attained to death. The extinction of the body is the perfect nirvana, just as the cessation of the wave results in the perfect quiescence of the water. Time and space are relative. They are relative to a particular consciousness. What for us would be a year, for someone who has manifested a subtler consciousness would be a shorter period of time. Similarly, it is possible for person who has obtained higher meditative stabilization to consider an eon a moment, or a moment an eon. 387. The identification of all things. Almost all things have the interrelationship of identification. First, the identity in form as two different elements combining to form unity. Identity is assumed because two distinct factors are united into one as copper and zinc are mixed together from one alloy, bronze. This identity in form is the explanation common to all Buddhist schools. Second, the identity in substance although there may be opposing angles. Identity is assumed because one's front and one's back may appear differently, but in reality they are one. 
there are opposing views as are the front and back of the same house. In the same way, if life is looked at from an illusion view, it is life, but, if it is looked at from an enlightened view, it is nirvana. The two views are simply refer to one thing. Some Mahayana schools hold this explanation of identity in substance. Third, the identity in form and substance as water and waver phenomenology. Identity is assumed because the whole entity is entirely one, as water and wave, the whole of water being manifested as wave. 388. Absolute. According to Buddhism, absolute means beyond comparison. The absolute is the reality of the appearances. The absolute is always of uniform nature. Nirvana or the absolute reality is not something produced or achieved. According to the Majjhimaka philosophy, Kandra Kurti, to the saints, the absolute is just silence, for it is inexpressible by speech. The absolute knowledge is the highest truth or tathata, the absolute. The illusory knowledge and empirical knowledge correspond to relative truth, samvati satya, and the absolute knowledge to the highest truth, paramartha satya, of the Madhyamaka system. In Buddhism, absolute is a synonym for suchness. It is unalterable, without modification, unaffected by anything, and a mark common to all dharmas. It also means emptiness for it is the absence of all imagination. Some people define it as reality limit, for it is that which reaches up to the summit of truth, to the utmost limit of what can be conized, and is quite free from error or perversion. Some other people define it as signless, for it is the absence of all marks. The absolute is further ultimate true, or the supreme object because reached by the supreme cognition of the saints. Furthermore, it also means non-duality, the realm of non-discrimination, non-production, the true nature of dharma, the inexpressible, the unconditioned, the unimpeded, nishprapanka, the actual fact, tattva, that which really is, yathabhuta, the truth, satya, the true reality, bhutata, nirvana, cessation, buddhahood, wisdom, enlightenment, the cognition which one must realize within oneself, the dharma body, dharmakaya, the buddha, and so on, and so on. According to Buddhism, absolute has many other meanings as follows. Suchness, tathata, emptiness, void, sunyata, nirvana, nibbana, non-dual, unproduced, the realm of non-discrimination, the true nature of dharma or the essence of being, dharmadhatu or damrata, the inexpressible thatness, tattha, free of verbalization and plurality, that which really is, the true reality, truth. The womb of tathagatas, tathagata garbha, reality which one must realize within oneself, and so on. According to the Yugacarans, the absolute idealism is the most characteristic doctrine, and is their so-called idealism, which is subjective with regard to the empirical and absolute, with regard to the transcendental subject. As to the first, it denies the independent reality of an external object, and merely continues the traditional ideas about the primacy of thought over all objects, though it may perhaps give them a somewhat sharper edge and a more pronounced epistemological content than they may have had before. In every mental act thought and its concomitants are of decisive importance, and the object is a shadowy appearance largely shaped and to some extent conjured up by thought. 389. Absolute Knowledge. The purpose of Buddhist cultivators is to attain the absolute knowledge so that they can eliminate all sufferings and afflictions and attain the final goal, which is the nirvana. The first absolute knowledge is the Pravakabuddhi. This is one of the two kinds of knowledge mentioned in the Lankavatara Sutra. Absolute knowledge corresponds to the Parinishpana. Pravakaya means to search through to examine thoroughly, and the buddhi so qualified penetrates into the fundamental nature of all things, which is above logical analysis, and cannot be described with any of the four propositions. The second absolute knowledge is the absolute nature or the fundamental principle or character. This is one of the three forms of Svabhavalakshana Sunyata or knowledge is the Parinishpana, perfected knowledge, and corresponds to the right knowledge, Samyujnana, and suchness, Tathata, of the five dharmas. It is the knowledge that is available when we reach the state of self-realization, by going beyond names and appearances and all forms of discrimination or judgment. 
It is the highest truth the Yogacara school's epistemological ultimate because it is the way things really are as understood by the unenlightened mind. It is the truth that ultimately all things are completely lacking in duality, even though they appear to the unenlightened mind under the guise of dualism. It is suchness itself, it is the Tathagata Garbharadaya, it is something indestructible. The rope is now perceived in its true perspective. It is not an object constructed out of causes and conditions and now lying before us as something external. From the absolutist's point of view which is assumed by the Lankavatara, the rope is a reflection of our own mind, it has no objectivity apart from the latter, it is in this respect non-existent. But the mind out of which the whole world evolves is the object of the Parinishpana, perfectly attained knowledge. 390. The Worldly World. The worldly world is also called the Jambudvipa. It is so named either from the Jambu trees abounding in it or from an enormous Jambud tree on Mount Meru, visible like a standard to the whole continent. Saha means sufferings and afflictions, it also means worries, binding, unable to be free and liberated. The worldly world is full of storm, conflict, hatred and violence. Ambadvipa is a small part of Saha world, the continent south of Mount Sumeru on which, according to ancient Indian cosmology, human beings live. In Buddhism, it is the realm of Sakyamuni Buddha. The world in which we live is an impure field, and Sakyamuni is the Buddha who has initiated its purification. People in this world endure many sufferings stemming from three poisons of greed, anger and delusion, as well as earthly desires. The Saha world is filled with dirt, rocks, thorns, holes, canyons, hills, cliffs. There are various sufferings regarding thirst, famine, hot, and cold. The people in the Saha world like wicked doctrines and false dharma and do not have faith in the proper dharma. Their lives are short and many are fraudulent. Kings and mandarins, although already have had lands to govern and rule, are not satisfied as they become greedy. They bring forces to conquer other countries, causing innocent people to die in vain. In addition, there are other infinite calamities such as droughts, floods, loss of harvest, thirst, famine, epidemics, etc. As for this Saha world, the favorable circumstances to cultivate in peace and contentment are few, but the unfavorable conditions of afflictions destroying path that are rather losing body mind they developed in the beginning. Moreover, it is very difficult to encounter a highly virtuous and knowledgeable advisor. According to the Buddha, the planet in which we are currently living is called Virtuous Southern Continent. It is situated to the south of Mount Sumeru and is just a tiniest part of the great world system of the Saha world, in which Zakyamuni Buddha is the ruler. Saha means sufferings and afflictions, it also means worries, binding, unable to be free and liberated. The worldly world is full of storm, conflict, hatred and violence. The world in which we live is an impure field, and Sakyamuni is the Buddha who has initiated its purification. People in this world endure many sufferings stemming from three poisons of greed, anger and delusion, as well as earthly desires. The Saha world is filled with dirt, rocks, thorns, holes, canyons, hills, cliffs. There are various sufferings regarding thirst, famine, hot, and cold. The people in the Saha world like wicked doctrines and false dharma and do not have faith in the proper dharma. Their lives are short and many are fraudulent. Kings and mandarins, although already have had lands to govern and rule, are not satisfied as they become greedy. They bring forces to conquer other countries, causing innocent people to die in vain. In addition, there are other infinite calamities such as droughts, floods, loss of harvest, thirst, famine, epidemics, etc. As for this Saha world, the favorable circumstances to cultivate in peace and contentment are few, but the unfavorable conditions of afflictions destroying path that are rather losing body mind they developed in the beginning. Moreover, it is very difficult to encounter a highly virtuous and knowledgeable advisor. According to the Buddha, the planet in which we are currently living is called Virtuous Southern Continent. It is situated to the south of Mount Sumeru and is just a tiniest part of the great world system of the Saha world, in which Zakyamuni Buddha is the ruler. Thus, Saha also called the place that which bears the earth 
interpreted as bearing, enduring, the place of good and evil, a universe, or great chiliochism, where all are subject to transmigration, and which a Buddha transforms, it is divided into three regions, and Mahabrahma Sahampati is its lord. World of endurance refers to our world which is filled with sufferings and affections, yet gladly enjoyed and endured by its inhabitants. According to Buddhism, Jambadvipa is the human world, the world in which we are living. Jambadvipa is a small part of Saha world, the realm of Sakyamuni Buddha. The southernmost of the four great landmasses, Kadardvipa, of traditional Buddhist cosmology. It is said to be named after the Jambu tree that grows there. It measures 2,000 yujanas on three sides, and its fourth side is only three and a half yujanas long. The southern continent, one of the four continents that's situated south of Mount Meru, comprising the world known to the early Indian. According to Idol in the Dictionary of Chinese-English Buddhist Terms, Jambadvipa includes the following countries around the Anavatapta Lake and the Himalayas. The north region includes Huns Mongolians Turks, the east region includes China Korea Japan, the south region includes northern India, 27 kingdoms, eastern India, 10 kingdoms, southern India, 15 kingdoms, central India, 30 kingdoms, and western Indian, 34 kingdoms. This is the end of this video. Dear fellow Buddhist, just as the Buddha emphasized the importance of generosity supporting the spread of the Dharma for spiritual growth, we can cultivate this virtue in our digital age. By subscribing, liking, and sharing our channel, you're supporting the dissemination of valuable teachings, much like this Sangha was supported in the past. Your engagement accumulates positive karma for you and helps make the Dharma accessible to a wider audience, a meritorious act indeed. Let's do this with pure intentions, free from attachment and selfishness, fostering a sense of community and supporting our own spiritual journey. These principles, rooted in Buddhist ethics, continue to guide us. You will receive great blessings for supporting the propagation of Buddha's teachings in a very simple way. By subscribing, liking, and sharing to help spreading the Buddha teaching to all human beings. Wishing you and your family always have a peaceful and happy life.